All right, thank you uh, everyone for inviting me. Um, I'll start by just giving uh, a background of how I got into reporting on this. I've, um, uh, in my career, I've reported on a lot of different topics from healthcare, education, prisons, even done food writing, dining reviews. Um, I got into this story a little bit over a year ago. The town I live in is Westerly, Rhode Island, and it's situated about halfway between uh, General Dynamics um, Submarine Shipyard in Connecticut and halfway between um, the General Dynamics Shipyard in Rhode Island. And in our town, they were building uh, an education center and I was curious about what was going to be going on there, you know, what, what classes would be taught there, all of that. When they unveiled it, it turned out that uh, about half of the space was going to be dedicated to training people who were going to be building uh, nuclear armed and nuclear powered submarines. Um, when it was announced, uh, the press release, they had a press conference, they had a ribbon cutting, and it was portrayed as, this is great news, we're getting jobs. General Dynamics is a great company. Your governor is great for giving them subsidies. Um, and the press mainly took that line, that um, those talking points that were given from the governor, from the company, and portrayed the story as, as that being it, that that was you know, what your takeaway should be. That's what people should know about it. Uh, at the time, I felt that um, there really needs to be much more of a public discussion about it. Uh, people weren't talking about why, um, why the state needed to be giving millions of dollars to a federal contractor that already got billions from the federal treasury. Um, why no one was talking about, you know, is the state okay with the fact that people here are going to be building nuclear weapons? Um, there seemed to be a lot of questions that um, people weren't asking, so I decided that I want to look into it. Um, someone I had taught with had become the executive editor at the Providence Journal. So I spoke to him and I said, you know, I, I think you guys should cover this uh, more critically. And he said, you know, why don't, why don't you do it? So I wrote a four-part series that I brought with me there. Um, it's in the second row. Uh, and that was, that was my first, um, the first series that I wrote. I've since written on the stock buyback issue. Uh, I launched my own site to put more uh, pieces up there that wouldn't be put into print uh, with the journal just because they didn't have the space or um, as much time to dedicate to the story. Um, of all the issues that I've reported on, this one has generated the most interest um, of anything I've reported on. Uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people have contacted me. Uh, I actually started looking into the Bath Iron Works story because people were writing to me individually th to my email. Um, they got in touch with me through other activists in Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, a few people had emailed the editor at the Providence Journal who then forwarded them on to me. And the message was that stuff was going on with Bath Iron Works, this other General Dynamics subsidiary, and people wished that there was more, um, more reporting, more thorough reporting on it. So that was why... Um, why I got into it, uh, into, into reporting on, on your state. Um, this talk that I'm going to give, this lecture, uh, is adapted from another lecture I gave in April at Brown University. A, a uh, anti-war student group asked me to uh, speak about the nuclear-armed submarines that are going to be built in Rhode Island and Connecticut, um, and speak about the defense industry in the two states uh, more generally. So I adapted it to include Maine, to have some, uh, also some interesting facts about your state in it, but then to also inform you about the uh, nuclear-armed submarines, it's the Ohio class of submarines. And that is really the most um, sort of, I guess you could say, substantial contribution of New England towards the, towards the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by just giving an overview of the um, kind of the situation in, in the three states that I've reported on. Um, Maine, this is obviously going to be the one that all of you are most familiar with. Um, my reporting, I've focused uh, primarily on this as, 
as a political economy story. So the amount of subsidies that go to the company and then also the campaign, campaign contributions that they give to public officials um, and how those relate to, to each other. So General Dynamics, Bath Iron Works, um, how many people here were involved in protests with them or? Right, okay, so everyone, all right. <laughs> all right, so this isn't new news. Um, so total state and local subsidies awarded since 1997, around 250 million. Um, so I have another stat here. Department of Defense is the largest federal contractor in the state, overseeing 88% of federal contracts in Maine. So that comes from an analysis uh, done in 2015 by the National Priorities Project, which is based in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, and their, their goal is to educate the public on the federal budget so people see where, uh, where their tax dollars are going and how much of a disproportionate amount goes to, um, to military spending. Um, because I'm going to be talking about nuclear weapons in this, uh, in this talk, one thing you guys probably want to be aware of is in the most recent nuclear posture review put out by the Trump administration, um, it raised the possibility, it said that the Navy was considering putting low yield nuclear weapons on Zumwalt destroyers, which are built at Bath Ironworks. And the idea here is they have low yield weapons. Um, obviously these are nuclear weapons, but they have less of a catastrophic impact as a Trident uh, nuclear warhead, which is what's on the submarines. Um, so the rationale why they're thinking of it is they're saying if Russia fired a low yield, smaller nuclear weapon um, at the US, at an ally, whatever, um, the U.S. would be in a position where they would think we can't retaliate with a massive strike. We have to have some lower yield, some lower impact strike. So therefore, we need to think about having smaller um, nuclear weapons, uh, more tactical nuclear weapons. So that's something that is including, included in the nuclear posture review that you probably uh, want to be aware of. All right, Connecticut. So uh, I grew up in Connecticut, um, and now I live in Rhode Island. In Connecticut, uh, it is one of the most defense-dependent states in the country. In 2016, in terms of total uh, Pentagon contract dollars, it was number four. Last year, it was number seven. So, and, and that's in comparison to these huge states like Texas and California and Virginia that are, you know, enormous contractors. So for a relatively small state, it's pretty incredible. Uh, southeastern Connecticut in particular, which is where the electric boat, General Dynamics electric boat shipyard is located, is the most uh, defense dependent uh, community in the state. And, and one of the most defense dependent in the country. So the major, um, the major players in Connecticut, General Dynamics, operating the electric boat shipyard in Groton, Connecticut. Um, they build attack submarines, Virginia class attack submarines, which are nuclear powered. And they build the nuclear armed submarines. Um, they built the Ohio class, which is the current fleet of nuclear armed submarines. And uh, they're going to be building the Columbia class, which is going to be the next generation of nuclear armed submarines. Um, so they have a long history of building nuclear armed submarines. They built the first uh, ballistic missile submarine for the US Navy, launched in, I think, 1959. Um, United Technologies is another big company. So they. Um, they are a, a huge conglomerate. Uh, one of their holdings is Pratt & Whitney. Pratt & Whitney builds uh, military engines. 34 armed, armed forces in the world uh, have Pratt & Whitney engines on their, um, on their Air Force fighters. So they are a client. Uh, they have clients all over, the, uh, all over the globe. Sikorsky is the helicopter maker. It was previously owned by United Technologies now it's owned by Lockheed Martin. Um, they build military, military helicopters, so uh, Black Hawk helicopters, Apache helicopters. 
Um, they sell them to the U.S. government. They sell them to other governments. Um, they sell to the Saudis. Um, they sell to Israel. Um, big, big uh, international contractor. So uh, one detail I was going to add is that there was a report uh, last December about Sikorsky saying that a, uh, an offensive brigade in, uh, in Saudi Arabia for the Saudi government um, that was being deployed in Yemen, uh, they did have Sikorsky made helicopters within that brigade. So the extent of how they were being used or if they were being used wasn't disclosed. Um, but it did say that they are, um, they are included in, in, the, in that actual brigade. That was in the website, The Young Turks. Um, Susan Collins, your senator, the Republican of Maine, um, last year she joined the Connecticut congressional delegation in writing a letter to the defense minister of Israel um, trying to convince him to buy Sikorsky helicopters. Um, for their armed forces. So um, one, of the, one of the peace activists, big peace activists in Connecticut is a guy named Henry Lowendorf. And when I interviewed him, he said these people are um, uh, salesmen and saleswomen for the, uh, for the weapons industry. And it, it sounds like hyperbole, but when you think about it, you know, someone who writes a letter to someone encouraging them to buy a product I mean, that is a salesperson, uh, so it's really a pretty apt description. Yeah, that criticism has been raised that if the, um, if the U.S. is selling weapons to other countries, then, um, then their technology goes up, and then we have to build new generations of weapons so that we'll be a step ahead of them. Um, so then it's just sort of fueling this ever higher increase in... Uh, and military spending. Um, okay, so total Department of Defense contracts within Connecticut uh, between fiscal year 2015 and 2017 was $37.8 billion to Connecticut. Um, fiscal year 2017 was $11.6 billion just that year. $5.2 billion of that went to Electric Boat, the submarine maker, the subsidiary of General dynamics. So in fiscal year 2017 in Connecticut, the money that was awarded to Electric Boat exceeded the combined total for all of these departments, what they gave to the state. So Veterans Affairs, Education, Labor, Transportation, Housing and Urban Development, Department of Agriculture. Um, the total for all of those departments was 3.6 billion. It was 5.2 billion for for electric boat alone. Okay, so in Rhode Island, uh, General Dynamics operating the uh, the second shipyard for submarine maker electric boat in Rhode Island. Raytheon has a campus in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Uh, Textron Textron builds um, uh, aircraft, including drones. Uh, other weapons, they're based in Providence. Northup Grumman has a smaller presence in Rhode Island as well. So total Department of Defense contracts, uh, 2015 to 17, 1.8 billion. Uh, FY 2017, 424 million. Um, the important thing to note is that the majority of the contracts to General Dynamics Electric Boat go through Connecticut. So that's not a really a, that $524 million isn't a real accurate reflection of how much uh, defense money is going into the state. Okay, so then, to, so to give you um, a comparison, so it was $524 million from the Department of Defense, which I said you know, the actual amount of money coming in is probably a lot higher. Compare that to other departments, what they allocate into the state. Department of Veterans Affairs, 473 million. Department of Education, 260. 50 million from the Department of Labor, 211 from the Department of Transportation, 243 
from housing and urban development, 100 million um, from agriculture. The only one that exceeds Department of Defense is um, uh, Health and Human Services. So that would be, you know, Medicare money that would that would exceed what the Department of Defense is is putting into Rhode Island. Okay, so congressional players within the three states, um, all all members of the main congressional delegation, they all receive money from the defense industry and from General Dynamics specifically. Um, but Susan Collins really stands out from from the other members of the delegation uh, in terms of uh, the real size of contributions to her and the, the consistency of them. Um, so it's also t important to note that she's on the Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee on Defense. So she plays a pretty critical role in deciding what money goes to what contractors, what programs. So you could probably make a causation link there. You know? <laughs> um, all right, so in terms of career campaign contributions from the defense industry, $623,000. Her top campaign contributor, um, total, not just defense industry, is General Dynamics, $163,000. Raytheon, $52,000. Lockheed Martin, $42,000. Uh, these numbers come from the Center for Responsive Politics, which tracks campaign spending, and they include PAC, um, PAC money and employee contributions to her campaign and her leadership PAC. Uh, another interesting thing about Susan Collins is her husband has uh, pretty substantial stock holdings in uh, several defense contractors. So in her last, um, in her most recent uh, financial disclosure report with the Senate, she disclosed that he had holdings, uh, stock assets in Boeing, United Technologies, Honeywell, and 3M, um, and previously had stock in Lockheed Martin. So that raises a potential conflict of interest uh, questions. You know, if she's making decisions about um, military spending, that is, you know, I mean, you could say it is affecting companies that he holds uh, stock in. Okay, uh, in Connecticut, uh, Representative Joe Courtney, uh, he's a Democrat. He represents the congressional district uh, that Groton is in, that the submarine uh, shipyard is in. Uh, he's on the Armed Services Committee, and he is on the Sea Power Subcommittee. He's the uh, ranking Democrat, so he's the, uh, he's the highest ranking Democrat on that committee. Um, so it, it tells you something about how, how these decisions are made. So Joe Courtney, before he became a U.S. congressman, he was a state lawmaker in Connecticut. He was an attorney. He had worked as a public defender, um, had no experience in the military at all. Uh, then he wins his seat, and he's immediately put on the Armed Services Committee, um, and then he becomes the highest ranking Democrat on the Sea Power Committee. Um, so I, I think you can reasonably say that he's there to be funneling money to this, to this contractor. He won his seat in 2006, um, 2006. He beat out a Republican incumbent by 83 votes. And so he got the nickname uh, Landslide Joe. It was supposed to be like a, a joke. Um, he went on this mission to up the submarine production at Electric Boat. Um, and if you read clips from national newspapers like the Washington Post, there are stories written in 2007, 2008 that essentially describe him just going to the, the big players on the Armed Services Committee and essentially begging them to give money to this company. Um, and it's reported right in the stories, you know, as if it's normal. So eventually, the submarine production did get upped at, um, at Electric Boat. They wanted to move submarine production from one submarine a year to two submarines a year, which it's now at. Uh, so people now, instead of calling him Landslide Joe, they call him Two Sub Joe. And uh, I, he would like to be called Three Sub Joe. In Connecticut, uh, 
Joe Courtney is the one I uh, focus on here because he's the major player within uh, the submarine making area. Uh, he gets the most amount of money from from defense contractors, but it would be misleading if I were if you guys were to come away thinking that he's the only guy in Connecticut who is uh, cheerleading for these people. Uh, universally across the board, you're not going to hear anyone who's on the congressional delegation in Connecticut criticize military spending. Um, Chris Murphy, he's a Democratic senator for Connecticut. He is um, he's known for his uh, opposition to U.S. involvement in Yemen, uh, which he deserves credit for. Um, but almost ironically, he's very much involved in the um, cheerleading of these companies, getting money for these companies. If you go to his national security page of his website, um, the, it's like the second paragraph is about how he gets all this money for these contractors. Um, that's what he focuses on. Uh, he votes for really large defense budgets. Um, so you see this in Connecticut where even someone who takes a remotely progressive anti-war view on one issue is still pretty beholden to these companies. All right, Joe Courtney. Um, so in terms of defense industry contributions, 711,000. General Dynamics is his largest campaign contributor at 166,000 and uh, 82,000 from United Technologies. So he's in a re-election year. Um, so I'm sure I'm going to have to update these numbers in a couple of weeks. Um, in Rhode Island, uh, Jim Langevin is the congressman for the district where the Rhode Island shipyard for General Dynamics is in Quonset, which is low. Quonset is the name of the shipyard, and it's in North Kingstown. Um, he's been in office since 2001. He's on the Armed Services Committee. He's on the Sea Power Subcommittee and he's on the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, defense industry total, 770,000. General Dynamics is also his largest campaign contributor at 178,000. Raytheon, 105. Northrop Grumman, 74,000. Um, so all these guys, they, they frequently are speakers at these um, defense industry conventions that they have each year in southern New England. They get up there, uh, they give a talk, they're introduced by the CEO of one of the companies who talks about how great an ally they are, and the, all the great work they're doing for them. Um, so it, it's not their, um, they're cheerleading for these companies, they're siphoning, you know, funneling money to them uh, it's not it's not anything that they really try to hide you know it's um, it's it's pretty out there in the open it's just become accepted yep it, it, if you look at the um, the amount of contract dollars they get versus how much they accepted campaign contributions it's a it's a pretty good return on investment um, the CEO of Northup Grumman uh, his name is Wesley Bush I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I think he and his wife have donated something like um, 25,000 to Jim Langevin in the last, since 2013 or so. Wesley Bush makes tens of millions of dollars a year. He's made like $100 million in the last, since 2010. Um, so return on investment is, is pretty good. All right, so this is Jack Reed. He's the senior senator from Rhode Island. Uh, he's a former Army Ranger. He's on the Armed Services Committee. He's the ranking Democrat. Uh, so if the Senate went flipped to the Democrats, he would presumably be the, uh, the chairman of the uh, Armed Services Committee. He's on the Sea Power Subcommittee, and he's also on the Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense with Susan Collins. Uh, so his numbers, 795,000, 109 from General Dynamics, 74 from Raytheon, and 68,000 from Textron. Okay, so I'm going to get into the details now of um, the nuclear weapons production history in Rhode Island and Connecticut. I said that right now uh, in Connecticut and Rhode Island, General Dynamics is readying itself to build 
the next generation of nuclear armed submarines, the Columbia class. Um, the current class is called the Ohio class of ballistic missile submarines. Uh, so these were built between um, 1979 and then the mid to late 90s. They were commissioned from 1981 to 1997. Um, during the Reagan presidency when uh, defense spending was booming, it was a really uh, big business time for electric boat, General Dynamics electric boat in Rhode Island and Connecticut. Um, they built uh, 18, 18 nuclear armed submarines for the Ohio class. That was eventually reduced to 14 that are now active under um, the START reduction treaty. And all of these submarines carry uh, Trident ballistic missiles. So the stated reason for these submarines is that they would be a deterrent that they lurk you know, beneath the surface of the ocean. Um, how deep they go is classified, but we know they can go at least 800 feet below the surface. Um, and the idea is that a country would not want to fire a nuclear weapon at the United States because that they, they would know that these uh, submarines are lurking somewhere and can launch a Trident missile that would be a retaliation. So one interesting thing to me when I was reporting on this is that in Rhode Island and Connecticut today, um, the current buildup is not really anything people talk about too much um, in, terms of a, in terms of protesting. Uh, politicians will talk about it as an economic development opportunity, um, all of that, but there's not really substantial pushback from the public, uh, at least at this point. When the last buildup occurred in the 80s and the 90s, there was uh, substantial pushback. There were large demonstrations. People broke into the facility in Connecticut and in Rhode Island to vandalize property. There was um, big resistance to it. People were arrested, um, large-scale protests. These are some pictures that peace activists um, who were involved at the time uh, gave me. This is a article from the New York Times from 1984 and it's about how the protests were getting so large in scale and counter protesters who thought that there should be um, you know we should be building these submarines they were coming out to counter the protesters and you're having massive crowds this was uh, 500 people were at this at this one demonstration between protesters and counter protesters and there were 300 police officers um, to, to police the protest. Uh, this is a story from the New York Times. This one in particular said that members of the Ku Klux Klan had come out to counter protest peace activists. Um, so they were there in their you know, hooded attire and um, all of that. Apparently they thought that the US should be building nuclear armed submarines. One point that I focused on in my reporting, because um, it does seem like people have amnesia or, or uh, politicians just want people to forget about what had happened in the past. Right now, the governor, uh, the executives at General Dynamics, they're selling Rhode Island and Connecticut on this idea that you can't pass up this opportunity. We're going to hire so many people. This is the greatest thing for your states. Um, but no one talks about the boom and the bust that already happened to this community, to these two states. So in the 1990s, so throughout the 80s, Electric Boat was building these submarines at, at such a large scale. Um, so much money was coming in from the Pentagon. And then uh, early 1990s, <laughs> Soviet Union collapses and uh, the De Department of Defense decides hey, we don't need to be building these um, submarines at this uh, breakneck speed that we're doing. So basically, the rug was pulled out from underneath electric boat. They went from having 23,000 uh, employees at their peak in the 1980s to having less than 10,000 by the end of the 1990s. This next uh, chart, so this shows the contract dollars 
that electric boat was getting in 1989 to build submarines, so it was 2.4 billion. In 1997, it hit not it hit 32 million. So that's a pretty steep drop off. This is an article from the New York Times. Uh, yes, electric boats giving stuff away. It was from uh, July 1997. And in it, it describes that the company, um, they just, the financial situation was so bad, they were giving away materials, they were giving away model ships to museums, any nonprofit that wanted something, they were giving it away. They just couldn't afford to keep this stuff and they had to get it, get it out of there. They, um, you know, were laying off people in the thousands. And the story says that one person who still had a job was this guy named the Giveaway King. And it was his job to find uh, people who wanted to take some of this material from the shipyard. And the quote from him was, we don't have room to store this stuff and there's no reason to store it because we'll never use it again. So in the early 1990s, this crisis hits and people start talking seriously about economic conversion. So this is um, Jack Reed, the senator for Rhode Island right now. He was a representative in 1991. And the Armed Services Committee, a subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee, the Investigations Committee, they held a special hearing in Newport, Rhode Island, and to talk specifically about what was going to happen to New England's defense economy. Now, now that they weren't going to be getting all this money from the Pentagon, what's going to happen? So they had all these speakers come up who were, who were saying, you know, oh my goodness, you know, we have to prepare for the worst. This is going to be huge. Um, we have to totally change our economy. So this is what Jack Reed said at the time. Uh, I believe if we begin to plan now and work together now, we can face this challenge of transforming our economy from a heavily defense-oriented economy to an economy that will produce products we can sell around the world. So um, at that time, he was, he was talking big about this idea that um, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Southern New England had to totally you know, revolutionize its economy, uh, get off of the defense dependency. Um, 27 years later now, he's, he's changed uh, his approach. So when I, I, I got the testimony from this, uh, from this hearing in 1991, and one interesting thing reading it is um, all these Congress members get up, they talk about this urgent need to convert the economy, um, economists submitted testimony that said the same thing. And then almost right at the end, they, um, they give the platform to an executive from Electric Boat, from General Dynamics Electric Boat, and uh, he says the following. I must make one point very plain. The primary objective of Electric Boat is very straightforward. It has become the Navy's sole supplier of nuclear submarines. We will pursue diversification where it makes sense, but not at the expense of our primary task. Um, so, so, so this guy basically got up there and he said, you know, thanks for your input, but no thanks. Um, this is our business model. All right, so from 2007 to present, there are these growing calls to increase submarine production, submarine budget and the pace of production at Electric Boat. Um, Electric Boat has been continuously building the Virginia class submarines. These are the attack submarines. And they split this work 50-50 with Newport News Shipbuilding in uh, Newport News, Virginia. That's a subsidiary of Huntington Ingalls, which is um, uh, also owns Ingalls Shipbuilding, which is the supposed competitor for Bath Ironworks. Um, so it's that same dynamic with the, with the submarines. Electric Boat has been named the prime contractor for the Ohio replacement um, submarines. These are called the Columbia class. So basically the Navy says that we've had these, we've had our current fleet of nuclear armed submarines long enough that they now need to be replaced. Um, and we're going to spend $104 billion to build an entirely new uh, weapons system. So the, um, 
Th this is a look at the defense contracts over the last 10 years to Electric Boat. So at 2008, they're at 2.5 billion. They spiked at 6.9 in 2014, and last year they're 5.2 billion. So they're back up in the boom period. Um, in the initial series I did for the Promise Journal, I think the graph might be in there. I got the numbers from current current defense contracts. Um, online and then I got previous reports going back to I think 1980 or no even earlier 19 early 1970s and it was on total uh, military dollars spent in Rhode Island and it basically just went like this it was a roller coaster and right now it's gone up here and it's like it's you know it's at the peak of the roller coaster so seemed to me as I was reporting the stories that um, Rhode Island and Connecticut were probably setting themselves up for um, another mass layoff situation and um, one one military analyst I spoke to he said you know you just don't know if it's gonna be five years ten years fifteen years or twenty years but it's gonna come at at some point okay so now General Dynamics Electric Boat is expecting um, this massive surge in production and a massive surge in hiring. So they want to go from uh, current 15,000 employees to 18,000 by 2027. And because they have an older workforce that's going to be retiring, they say they need to hire between 14,000 and 15,000 workers uh, to fill those positions. So some specifics of the Columbia class. So the plan is to build 12 submarines. Um, the fleet is currently at 14, but the plan is that these submarines would have, um, they would be nuclear power, the nuclear power, the, the, it would work in a different way that they wouldn't need to be refueled at their half-life the way they are now. So they could have more out there um, doing the deterrent missions and they wouldn't have to therefore have as many. Um, delivered to the Navy between 2027 and 2041 and the work would be split between Newport News and Electric Boat with 80% of the work going to Electric Boat and 20% going to Newport News. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office says it's going to cost upwards of $104 billion um, and that's in 2006, uh, 2016 dollars. Uh, the Navy says that it's going to cost $100 billion and that if you inflation adjusted that for the lifetime of the construction, that would be $128 billion. And the Navy says um, there is a greater than 50% chance that they're underestimating the cost of it. So this is all part of a $1.2 trillion nuclear modernization. Uh, that was started under the Obama administration and is now being continued under the Trump administration. So a total, um, total revamping, total overhaul of all components of the U.S. nuclear triad. So land, sea, and air. So I have some quotes here from people uh, who are critical of this plan. Um, this, this is a U.S. Naval Institute analyst named Norman Polmar, and he says, we, we just can't afford it, six billion per submarine. I'm going to have a coronary every time I say that. So this was from an interview I did for the Providence Journal. This was a, another uh, analyst from the U.S. Naval Institute, and so these aren't, uh, you know, leftist think tank people. These are pretty mainstream military guys. Uh, the dirty secret is who knows what's going to happen because the money's not there. Uh, so this was from David Adams of the U.S. Naval Institute. And this quote is from uh, William Hartung from the Center for International Policy. It's hard for a local community to turn down the jobs, but I think it's important to look at the bigger picture. The more we build these things, the more likely we are to have a new arms race with Russia and possibly China. Um, so I recently interviewed um, 
a researcher named Hans Christensen at the Federation of American Science, um, this American Scientists. He writes a lot on the U.S. nuclear arsenal and nuclear weapons in general. And he was saying that we, we are in a new arms race already. It's not, you know, that it could happen. We are in it. And he said, but because of um, arms reduction agreements that we've already signed, the arms race right now isn't, you know, who can have the most warheads. It's who can have the most advanced technology. So that's basically causing the U.S. to pursue these incredibly expensive weapon systems, and, and these submarines are going to be uh, among them. So really extremely exceptionally advanced technology that comes at a uh, very high cost. So in terms of subsidies to General Dynamics, um, Maine, uh, you guys are in first place. Um, whole, the nationwide, um, if, you, if you look it up, no, no state has given more subsidies to General Dynamics than Maine. Um, hmm? Yeah, by quite a bit too. So you guys are at about um, 250 million, and I think Connecticut at 125 is, is the next one, so double what anyone else has uh, put up in subsidies. Um, no, it's done by the state, so through state government and Bath through local government, municipal government. Um, but Connecticut and Rhode Island have certainly ramped up the amount of money in recent years. Um, so this is from 2008 onward, um, 125 million in subsidies awarded to uh, Electric Boat from Connecticut. So that's through grants, um, loans, and yeah, grants and loans, and then uh, and, and through tax credits. Um, I mean, Maine is so far ahead too because they started off at 194 million with that um, with that deal in 1997. So, Rhode Island, 55 million in subsidies through grants, um, grants, tax credits. This number was a lot smaller two months ago. Um, in a a end of April. Governor Daniel Malloy in Connecticut announced an $83 million subsidy deal. And then at the end of the week, Gina Raimondo, the governor um, for Rhode Island, announced a $34 million deal. So they're putting uh, a lot of money into this company. So to give you, um, kind of give you a sense of the total picture, um, the it's interesting because Bruce, you, you've talked a lot about how um, Democrats, Democrats, you know, kind of railed on uh, on uh, the GOP for their tax for their tax bill, this giveaway to corporations, reducing their tax rate, and then Democrats in Maine then wanted to give a uh, sixty million dollar subsidy at first, and then reduce to forty five million. Sort of the hypocrisy of that um, in Rhode Island and Connecticut. Um, both states have all Democratic congressional delegations. When they announced their $83 million and $34 million deals, uh, the members of the delegation were there for the announcement, the governors were there, and they all said, this is great, we're creating jobs. Um, and meanwhile, General Dynamics, uh, their effective tax rate because of this GOP law uh, has been reduced from 28.6 to 19%. So they're getting, you know, quite the windfall from this. Um, and that was that tax bill that all these people were criticizing. Um, and it, it really is sort of, I think you can objectively say that it's ridiculous that the governor of Connecticut or the governor of Rhode Island is saying, trying to take credit that they're creating jobs. Um, a company that's getting billions of dollars from the federal taxpayers, um, I think you can pretty reasonably say that these jobs have already been been created. Um, having watched it play out in all the in in each in all three states, um, Maine to me was the most impressive in terms of the opposition. But you also had representatives who um, 
at least gave you the courtesy of the veneer of democracy by, by, by proposing it as, as a bill, you know? So, so Jennifer DeChant, she wrote the bill. You guys had hearings. You all protested it. Um, I think, I mean, Bruce, you said that you thought it was kind of, you were pretty sure they were going to do it anyway, right? So you, you kind of knew from the get-go that they were likely going to approve something. Um, in Rhode Island, in Rhode Island, no one knew of anything. One day, the governor says we're having a press conference and announces uh, we're giving away $34 million to this company. Be happy, people. I've created jobs. So there was no, there was no you know, uh, bill proposed. There was no public hearings or nothing like that. In Connecticut, um, a state senator proposed giving $150 million to electric boat. Um, I, being someone who follows us more closely than anyone in, in, the, in Connecticut and Rhode Island, um, I had trouble following this bill. First, they put up a placeholder that had no details. Then all of a sudden, they had another bill that you know, the name had been changed, and it was changed to uh, the Apprenticeship Connecticut Initiative, which you hear that, like, who, <laughs> you don't think $150 million to uh, you know, a submarine maker. Um, it was written in this extremely confusing way that you didn't really even understand where most of the money was going to go to. Um, it doesn't name, none of these bills, by the way, name General Dynamics by name. It just says, um, it describes a company that only General Dynamics could fit the description of, or, you know, Huntington Ingalls, but, you know, presumably they're not giving money to them. Um, they, allow, they had a public hearing. It was during a day of about 10 hours of testimony. So people could go and uh, give their testimony. Three, three groups, two groups, and then uh, a citizen gave testimony. Um, the, the, the two groups gave it, it was a small manufacturer's association. They just gave a written testimony. And they said, this is ridiculous. Um, you want to help manufacturers put this money into our vocational schools. The woman who went down to give her testimony, and she's a peace activist, she had to wait several hours. She gets up there, um, she gave her testimony, and she said, I'm happy to answer your questions. And, and none of them said anything. The, um, one, of, one of the guys looked like he was sleeping, basically. Um, so then that happens, the bill passes, the bill passes a, um, a committee hearing, and then people are waiting to see what happens. People are trying to get themselves organized to, to uh, oppose it. And uh, no news. People are following the bill. They were getting, you know, so you could get email updates. Nothing happens. Then one day the governor announces, I'm giving $83 million to this company. So it was sort of like, um, sort of like sham. I, I interviewed the woman who testified, and she said it was a sham, you know, that she wasn't participating in any type of democratic process. Yep. When I, when I wrote that first series, the, um, the editor, he said, you know, he's like, Alex, this needs to be bulletproof because shots are going to be fired. We're writing a critical story about a big company. Like, you know, you can't mess anything up. Like, there can't even be a misspelling of anyone's name. Like, he was nervous. So then he published it. It was, you know radio silence. They just, I mean, they think they're above, they don't, they don't think they have to um, address it, really. In Connecticut, um, I, I think because you all, you had the experience of them going to, the, uh, to Bath City Council for money kind of recently, like 2013, right? So you had some mobilization around that. The peace activists in Connecticut, um, one of them, Joanne Sheehan, this woman who's been involved in protesting the submarines since like the 1970s, she said to me over the phone, she said, um, you know, I don't know anything about legislation. I don't even know how to kind of go about protesting. This isn't what I do, you know. Um, so, and, and certainly the way that Connecticut went about proposing the, uh, proposing the, the giveaway, they didn't really make it easy for their or even possible for people to uh, participate in the process. Um, but then, I mean, I would also say, though, in, in Rhode Island, there are people who had been on 
the delegation about more sort of national, global issues. Um, both senators in Rhode Island voted against the, the Yemen war resolution. Um, they, they both, and Jim Langevin, the congressman, voted for the, um, uh, the last national defense authorization bill and previous ones, you know, setting military spending at, you know, astronomical levels. So people had been, um, had been pressuring these people for, uh, for their support of military spending and war. They had been less aware of what was going on at the local level. And I think that's changed in the last year. And I did notice after the, um, after the $34 million was announced, uh, people on social media um, were, were, were commenting on this is ridiculous, this is absurd, you know. So I, I, I think that the governor thought that she was going to get this universal reception of everyone saying, you know, thank you, this is so great. And, it, and I, think, I think public opinion has shifted. I think, though, that people there aren't as organized as, as you all are and didn't, uh, and, and honestly, if the governor just announces it randomly, I mean, how are they supposed to even, um, you know, oppose it ahead of time? One interesting thing in Rhode Island is our, um, our governor, uh, she's a uh, first-term governor. She's running for re-election this year. Um, she's a former venture capitalist. She, her, her sort of, her whole branding is, around this idea of she's a jobs creator and she's doing all these things to create jobs for Rhode Island. And the whole jobs creation plan is built around giving tax incentives to, to corporations. Um, and I think with a lot of people, uh, progressives in Rhode Island, that, that sort of messaging that she's put out there has really backfired because I think people, people kind of see through it as just corporate giveaways and they, they perceive her as being a very kind of corporate governor. Um, and have questioned, you know, what has she done for um, average, average Rhode Islanders. Um, right now, there's a guy who is challenging her in the Democratic primary. He was previously the Secretary of State of Rhode Island, and he left office like 10 years ago, kind of fell out of the political scene, and then announced recently that he wants to, ch that he's challenging her for governor. Um, it turns out that the last 10 years, he had been running an anti-nuclear weapons um, group called Global Zero that wants to eliminate nuclear weapons worldwide by 2030. Um, so that was pretty interesting to me that this, this guy who founded this anti-nuclear weapons group wants to be uh, governor of a state that builds nuclear weapons. Um, so I did, I did an interview with him, and I, I was blown away by how... Um, how critical he was of General Dynamics and of the governor um, and of the congressional delegation. He really called out everyone. Um, I thought that he might start kind of, you know, not backpedaling, but maybe kind of soften the tone, but he was, he was pretty critical. And he's really picked up steam. A lot of progressive Democrats in the state have gotten behind him. So there is, um, there could be an interesting shift in public opinion. And when I interviewed him, at the beginning of the interview, he said, um, you know, I just want to start by saying that I read all your stuff. It's great. It's amazing. And I, th I thought he was just buttering me up. But, <laughs> but then as we were talking, he was referencing facts about buybacks, about the corporate giveaways, about the CEO's compensation, all this stuff where I, I actually realized that he actually had read the articles. Um, so in Rhode Island, you know, previously I'd interviewed all the major people and I couldn't find anyone in a public position, elected or appointed, who was willing to say anything remotely critical about General Dynamics. Um, and now there's a guy running for governor who has a good shot of unseating the, um, the current governor and he's speaking really critically about, uh, about the, the company. Um, so Gina Raimondo is her name. Uh, she's a Democrat. Um, she was um, uh, preceded by uh, Lincoln Chafee. You, you might remember him. He ran for uh, president in the Democratic primary. When he was governor, he was governor for one term, and he got a total of $425, 425 from General Dynamics, so not that much at all. The biggest single donation he got was $200. Um, so now she's governor, 
and she's already received um, 11,000, um, what was it, 11,100 dollars or something like that from General Dynamics. Um, vast majority all coming at the thousand dollar level, which is the limit level for um, in Rhode Island for a single donation from a single person. And it's, it's virtually all coming from these executives at General Dynamics. Um, so I'm not saying she's a pay for play politician, but it's uh, kind of compelling evidence there. Uh, so this is a quote from Ralph Nader, the um, consumer rights advocate and advocate of many other causes. Uh, so at the time when Connecticut was uh, apparently considering the subsidy deal, I actually I sent in a question to his radio show to see if he would answer it on air because he's, he's from Connecticut so I thought he might be interested in it and, um, and he responded to it a after the subsidy deal was approved and he essentially made the point that Bruce just made and he said we have a new chapter in corporate welfare not only are you required to fund football stadiums and baseball stadiums taxpayers or other companies in the civilian area, you're also now beginning to be required to fund a locked-in Pentagon military contract, which by definition is profitable. It's built right into the contract. Once again, autocracy reigns. So, yeah, so like you said, they're, they're hitting, up these, um, hitting up the states for the subsidies. And one thing that I've reported on is that, you know, one of the arguments that they always made was, yes, this is a lot of money. Um, yes, this is maybe unethical, but these are really good jobs. These are really good jobs. And this time around, I'm, I've not been convinced that these, uh, these are all really good jobs, at least in Connecticut and Rhode Island. So... When I did the initial series for the Providence Journal, I asked the Department of Labor and Training to provide me the average starting salary for an electric boat employee who was being, um, who was being um, trained with state funds. And they got back to me with a number 35,000, which seemed pretty low, you know, and that's not, I mean, they're, they're trying to sell me on the idea that these are middle class jobs, that you're going to raise a family. 35000 you know, a year is, is, is not that. I did a story on looking into the uh, state reports on companies that have employees receiving Medicaid, uh, uh, Medicaid or um, uh, dependents who are receiving Medicaid. Electric Boat had a number of employees, you know, and the, the amount of benefits that were being paid out by taxpayers was in the millions. Um, there was a story in the, um, in the New London paper about how the same state senator who was proposing the subsidy deal, she had taken the executives at Electric Boat on a tour of a, uh, old, an old mill space that had been renovated and they used um, affordable housing money that the state had available to renovate this mill make it a really nice place. And people who moved in there could get affordable housing cost reductions on their places if they met um, the income requirements. And in the story it says, um, people who will be starting an electric boat, uh, many of them will have incomes low enough that they could be, um, you know, they, they, they could qualify to have subsidized housing at this state paid for renovated mill space. Um, and it said, you know, that they're going to be moving in people from other areas of the state and moving in people from other states. Uh, so not only do you have the fact that this money was used to renovate this, this mill building, which isn't cheap, uh, so that there could be affordable housing for people in that community. So now they're moving in people from other communities uh, to use that affordable housing that, you know, should be going to the people who already live there. And then you also have the question of, well, if these are such great jobs and they're so worth it and the state needs to put so much subsidy money behind it, um, why then are these people qualifying for um, housing assistance? My instinct in reporting it so far is that 
I, I, I think these jobs had been very well paying for people who had them. And I think now they're at this situation where they have all these people retiring. And I think they're trying to hire a new workforce that's going to be at a much lower wage level than the people who are retiring. And that's the story of you know, corporate America in general today. And that gets on to my next part of the slide pretty well, too. Um, the reception to all of this from the local media uh, has been pretty, uh, pretty embarrassing in terms of how uncritical the reporting has been. And you, I mean, you see in it that people, reporters and editors, they will parrot talking points from the company and from the governor without scrutinizing at all um, what they're saying. So they'll say, so the, the editorial page of the Providence Journal has gotten totally behind this and uh, is totally cheerleading for it. And they say, you know, these are great middle class jobs. This is a great idea. But it's sort of like in, in journalism school, I was taught, you know, you, you, you don't want to use vague or euphemistic phrases. Um, you want to say exactly what you're saying. So instead of saying middle class job, say what these jobs actually pay. So middle class job is just, it's just a term that they're throwing around. They don't, it doesn't mean, it's basically meaningless, but it gives people the impression of something that might not be true. Um, so the overall, the overall coverage has really been to just take basically talking points from press releases and press conferences and then fashion the story as being, you know, how it's been presented by the governor and, and general dynamics. So this is, this is a pretty interesting one from, from the Providence Journal uh, editorial board. Um, so in July 2017, the president of Electric Boat, he began sending around op-eds to the Providence Journal, the, the Day newspaper of New London, Connecticut, and the Hartford Current. And it was kind of repurposed. It all said the same thing about how this is great. And his, his, he, was, he was using the expression, this is a win-win. This is a win-win for all of us. So fast forward uh, about six months later, the editorial in the Providence Journal basically borrows his talking point and just says, this is a win-win. So it, it was just planted basically a few months earlier and it's just been adopted as you know, what they're going with. So this is, a, um, this is another one. This was after the $34 million was announced. Exciting news at Electric Boat. And then it says, yes, we're going to be spending all this money, but it's worth it. Um, these are the uh, endorsements. Joe Courtney is bringing in jobs. Um, I, I just see it as it simplifies it in such a way that, I mean, I, I wouldn't even say simplify, because simplify makes it sound like there's some element of truth to it, but it's sort of like, um, it just frames it in such a way that is, um, I think, a disservice to the reader, and they don't, um, they don't get to engage with an issue in a, a serious way at all. Um, to even understand like the, the, all the dynamics you know, related to Congress, to how economic development happens, to uh, the geopolitics of having nuclear weapons. Um, it's, just, it's just reduced this um, very simple um, framing of it. Uh, two Sub Joe brings jobs. This was a video from one of the local TV stations and um, it was all about how we're going to be building these submarines. And nowhere in it do they ever, they, and they say, this is good news for Rhode Island. This is good news for Rhode Island. Jobs are coming. And they never even mention um, that these are nuclear armed weapons, nuclear powered and nuclear armed. And, I, and I've talked a lot about the business reporting angle to it. But I thought an another reason why I wanted to report on this story was I felt that um, if a community is dedicating itself to building nuclear weapons, there should be some discussion. People should say, you know, um, people who live in that area should be saying, you know, whether or not they actually agree with that. They should be aware of um, what that means and, and uh, aware of um, what people are saying about the necessity of those weapons and the implications of those weapons. Um, and, and people are just denied that, uh, the ability to have that conversation at all. Um, and, you know, the congressional delegation, the governor, they all want to frame it in a way that people um, are not educated on it. 
that they just see it simply as this, um, this jobs issue. Um, so business at Electric Boat, like all the other major defense contractors, uh, their stock has been trading at, at or near record highs um, this year. If you look at, I think it's, it's basically more than quadrupled since 2010. Um, after the strikes in Syria, um, a lot of the defense contractors, they just had a, an immediate spike in their stock price. So this is the annual report, 2017, revenue up to 31 billion, total backlog, 63.2 billion, up a billion, uh, diluted earnings per share up 10.6%. Uh, Marine Systems Group, which includes Electric Boat and BIW, earnings grew 15%. Uh, the stock buyback issue, I think a lot of you guys are familiar with that. In 2017, they totaled 1.5 billion 2013 to 2017, 10.9 billion. Uh, record high for the company in 2013, 3.4 billion. Uh, this all accelerated under the current CEO who started in 2013. Um, so stock buybacks, that's using the cash that they have on hand to buy their own stock on the open market. Um, something companies used to rarely do because laws prevented them from doing it. Uh, when the SEC changed its rules in the 80s, people started doing it more. In corporate America, it's accelerated in the last decade. Um, so this is all money that the company's not putting into research and development, which you would think that the Pentagon would be concerned about if they want these companies to be researching and developing things that keep us safe. Um, they're not going to employee pensions. Last year, they did $1.5 billion on buybacks. $200 million went to employee pensions. Um, and then there's the question of, well, if you need this money from the states, why are you using money to buy back your own stock? Um, people who think stock buybacks are justified, they, they'll say, well, you need to do it. Uh, it's okay to do it if you think your stock price is uh, undervalued. Um, yeah, that's not an undervalued stock price. Um, the other reason would be that you don't see any investment opportunities for your company in the near future. So you don't have anything to invest in, why not you know, buy back your stock? Well, if they're going to be building a $104 billion um, uh, nuclear weapon system, they have all, these other, uh, all this other work in the pipeline, I don't think you could say that they don't have something that they can invest in. Uh, this was a quote from the CEO uh, from the earnings call with regard to the GOP uh, tax law. Uh, she called it a happy event. Uh, this is a quote from a uh, uh, defense industry analyst whose uh, group has actually uh, receives funding from General Dynamics and other defense contractors, uh, but it is a pretty telling quote. Boeing makes planes, Raytheon makes missiles, General Dynamics makes money. And this is from the, uh, you guys have probably seen his name cited. He was the um, UMass Lowell professor who provided a lot of information for the buyback story. Uh, that I originally wrote for the Province Journal, and he said, I think his taxpayers were being taken for fools. And uh, that's it. Yeah. Good.